It's happening, guys. The other half of Civil War press conference is starting. This time, I would like to very much like to welcome a team cap. First on out of the gate, it's Paul Rudd himself. <laughs> Following. Come on down here, Mr. All right. Rudd. I just don't want to. I don't want to step on Captain America's toes. Nope, never. All right, sorry. It's all good now. We're all we're all set to go. The, we're all right. The voice of Anthony Mackie will be followed by his body. We love you, Detroit. Uh, Anthony, it's not Detroit. Oh. <laughs> Bet. Yeah, so awkward. Hi, Los Angeles. Oh. Uh, it's Sebastian Stan, get on out here. I did not have a. Uh, you didn't have anything prepared. A city for us. <laughs> <laughs> it's Cap himself, Chris Evans. Oh, all right. I. Um, this is fun. Couches. I thought it was going to be like a table. Right? Yes. I know, it was a surprise to us You're all. Real sit on the table, dude. Sorry. Very comfortable. We're keeping it real for Elizabeth Olsen coming I'm out sit back. <laughs> Everyone else is sitting forward. I'm going to sit back. I think, I think it's a better idea. Okay. Yeah, let's just set the tone, you know? <laughs> and then. <laughs> real cool entrance. <laughs> Stalling, yeah. perhaps, to allow more microphones to be attached to Jeremy Renner. <laughs> yeah, we don't have to clap. We don't have to clap. Our director we have not yet heard from, this Joe so Rosine. D. 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 Oh. Oh. It's a crowded couch up there. Wow. How's it going, Joe? And right. then welcoming back Kevin Feige. Oh, <laughs> Anthony? Oh. 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 He's our, he's our, he, oh. He opted for that front seat. Chris, I want to throw you the first question here, because even though in the Marvel Universe and in previous movies, everyone in the film is so well represented and it's so balanced, do you feel an even bigger responsibility when you're a part of a movie whose first two words of the title is Captain America? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, there, there's pressure, but I don't think it's anywhere near the pressure that, to be honest, the people like the Russos or Marvel feel, because it honestly is... The, the, the movies live and die based on the directors and the producers and how I mean, we've all seen phenomenal actors and great scripts that still didn't come to fruition in a good way and, and it really goes to show that a good movie lives and dies based on the directors. You, you could have all the other pieces in place but unless you have quality storytellers you may fall on your face and so uh, yeah there's pressure but not as much as you guys so <laughs> good luck. Uh, you know they did it. They did their job real well. Joe? Speaking to you as a director, but part of a team, like that's that's a pretty rare thing to see, especially in a major motion picture, like two directors taking on several movies. Do you feel that you have particular strengths and Anthony has different particular strengths? Mm, that's a tough question. Mm. You're Just really putting me on the spot. What does he Just... suck at? Just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, we've been doing this for a long time together. We grew up watching movies together, a very similar aesthetic and we were, working at, we were working in TV for a long time together. I, I don't think that there's a, there is no true division of labor for us. It's, um, uh, it's just a, a pure collaboration and, uh, you know, really, um, you know, we always say that, you know, the, the only thing that uh, uh, is, uh, is, is tricky for us is, is um, who has enough energy to get out of the chair to go speak to the actors <laughs> after the take. Uh, but other than that, uh, um, you know, everything is shared equally. How difficult and challenging was it and your considerations in the mill of the action of bringing it to life? Uh, you know, I don't want to repeat what my brother said on the, on the, on the prior panel, but, you know, action is, is very important to us. These movies are about action. The characters express themselves through action. Uh, action has to have storytelling to it for us or it's vacuous and, and superficial and you know you can you'll get tired of an action sequence if it's not either defining the character or moving the story forward in some way. Uh, it takes an incredible amount of effort and think 
God we have such an incredible team of collaborators, including Kevin and Marcus and McFeely and Nate Moore, who, uh, who, who works at Marvel as well, who, who, can, who, who can work with us and keep us honest in terms of the storytelling, uh, and this cast, uh, who are also the caretakers of the characters in a way that we never could be. Um, so, uh, it, you know, it's, it's by far and away the hardest thing to do on a film. The easiest thing to do on a film is when you have a uh, Soderbergh level of cast like this uh, to, uh, to, to put down the dramatic scenes uh, on camera, especially uh, with, with actors of this caliber who have been playing these parts for this long. Uh, th those are some of the easiest things we do. Some of the hardest things we do uh, is, is, the, is executing the action. And I think the, the toughest sequence by far in this film which we literally probably just finished a, a, a week or two ago was, uh, was the airport sequence. Uh, it's filled with a lot of moving parts, a lot of different characters. You want to move each character forward. You want to make sure that you're not leaving anybody behind. Uh, um, and, uh, and, you know, I think we, we, we went well into the post process, still reshaping and rethinking and, and reconfiguring that sequence to make sure that it had its, its maximum uh, a storytelling thrust to it. Who would you fight against? Who would I fight in, 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 in Team yeah. Iron Man? Who would I fight? Yep. Uh, well, I'd probably want to aim low. You know, you don't want to fight Vision because he's going to destroy terrible. you. Um, I don't know. I, I think, you know, in order to survive, I'd probably take Black Widow just because at least she's human. Um, you know, but, but out of, out of a, from a character standpoint, probably Iron Man because our characters obviously have the most friction. Hi, Angela Dawson, Front Row Features. My question actually is for all the actors. I wanted to ask you about doing that airport sequence and, and how that was for you, how many days it was, what was the most challenging part of that, and were you satisfied when you saw the finished product? Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was hot. It's Atlanta in August, so I think everyone was, was toasty. Um, and there's only a couple scenes where, you know, a couple shots where, you know, you might have that one... 50-50 where everyone's running together, but for the most part, it's you know picks and pops, and you're just getting pieces. So it's a lot of waiting around, but you you really have a uh, confidence that this is going to be something special. You can see in Anthony and Joe's face and Kevin, it, these guys get so excited when these moments work. Um, it's it's a meticulous process because it's such a grand scheme. So on the day, it's not as as you know cool and romantic as you think it would be, but but th th there's an energy on set and, and, and an excitement. That, that keeps you invested, uh, knowing that it's going to be something epic. Mark Hughes with Forbes. Um, Paul, when you say, I believe this belongs to you, Captain America, <laughs> was that improvised? And how many other different lines? I mean, did you try out several different ways of saying that? Because that just seems so you and was such a amazing <laughs> And Jeremy, Kill the Messenger is amazing. I love the film. I just wanted to say that. Oh, thank you. And that's exactly how you sounded delivering that line. You did a better job than I yeah, did, I yeah, think. Yeah. I don't No, I think that was in the, I think that was always in the script. The, uh, I think this belongs to you. We, you know, we sometimes would play around with lines and stuff while we're shooting it, and these guys uh, uh, would suggest things, and but and then sometimes we'd come up with, with things after the fact. One of the great things about having a mask is that if you think of a great joke afterward, you don't have to you don't have to match it to anything, so you can add stuff even in ADR. But that was I think that was one that was that was always in there. He's being modest. Paul is like one of the great improvisers um, uh, that you could hope to work with, and. Uh, it is true when you, when you have the mask, and I think uh, uh, um, that was a great benefit to us in the post process. Again, in terms of modulating the tone in that uh, that section of the movie, uh, but you know we we had like endless amounts of uh, of jokes that uh, Anth and I and our editor Jeff Ford and Kevin would sit in the edit room and laugh about for hours and try to figure out. It was not an easy task uh, which one was funnier than the other, uh, and he you know he just gave us a wealth of material. Yeah. To meet how uh, how I felt as far as being the fanboy of the group that that was not really uh, there was very little acting required in that scene from me. You know, they've all worked together and done this before. I've just seen the movies. I mean, I've uh, seen all the Marvel movies. So to be there on the day, I kind of couldn't stop geeking out about it. And I thought, oh my God, there's the shield. And uh, and I thought, you know, there's that there's that arm. There you weren't looking. 
And I was just like, <laughs> like wow, there it was. God man. dang, man. <laughs> and, uh, and so, like, that, that kind of. That kind of thing. Even when I was getting the suit on, you know, there's this area where we'd get changed and stuff, and, um, and it's like, oh, there's an Iron Man suit. Like, Whoa, you know, and, uh, and there they all are. I did, I, I did feel that that excitement of what I can't believe that I landed here. This is nuts. Um, so it was really cool. Uh, my question is for uh, Kevin and Joe. Uh, you got to introduce a lot of the bug-centric superheroes into the mix in this film. Uh, but we saw oh, yeah. Ant-Man and Spider-Man, no Wasp. Um, can you explain the decision what behind the not book? bringing Evangeline Lilly into this film? Uh, there were drafts uh, where Wasp participated in the uh, splash panel fight, the airport, the airport battle. Um, and the truth is, it... It you took away the fun of seeing her suit up for the first time, of seeing her on that road to being a hero. We, we experienced that with, with, with Ant-Man in, uh, in uh, his own movie. We experienced that with Spider-Man in many movies. Um, and we have big plans, and we later announced the title of Paul's uh, sequel, which is Ant-Man and the Wasp. So we have very big plans to unveil her in her own movie, where she can be the entirety of the movie and not a moment in, uh, in, a, in an action scene. Kevin, I have a question for you because it's kind of hard as a, like an excited fan to like live in the moment of the movie because once you've seen it, you're like, oh my god, what's next, right? And I was wondering as, as the Marvel universe expands, like with some of the Netflix shows being considerably darker, having a different tone, do you feel that ripple effects are going to be felt from shows like that in the further cinematic universe? They might be, but I think what I love is is you're now seeing in the film medium, in the television medium, the reflection of what the comics have always been. There's always been that great, you know, diversity of tone within the comics, and I love that uh, that we're seeing more and more of that uh, on on the on on various screens. So is that a yes? That's a sure. Your <laughs> character, uh, he was supposedly like protecting the, the the true like the old American values, and in this case, he's just rejecting. Uh, the, con the, the government control and sure. maybe <clears throat> the United Nations. So I would like you to talk about that. That's very interesting. This movie that they're sure. Very exciting, right? Well, with regards to whether, you know, that was always a concern whether, you know, the, the, the name America, whether or not that would kind of. Uh, uh, polarize certain audiences. But the truth is, the, 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 the name America, I mean, what he stands for is something that's ubiquitous across the world. What, you know, what he believes in, you know, honor and morality and values, that's something you can find anywhere. But in terms of who he's been throughout the arc of his character, you know, he's always kind of fought for the greater good. He's always kind of put the needs of the masses before his own desire. And that's exactly what's different in this film. Instead of kind of uh, whoops, that, that, you know, let's put that in my lap for a second. Um, <laughs> instead of kind of uh, dedic dedicating himself towards what others need, uh, in this film he kind of prioritizes what he wants, which is a departure from what he's normally allegiant to. So, so I think it's, it's, again, it colors the character in a really nice way. Uh, you know, you have a guy who's this incredibly austere and, and, and moral character. It's hard trying to find ways to make him layered and dynamic, and I think in this movie he becomes potentially selfish, where, where he kind of puts his own desires first, but it's rooted in family, which is, I think is a, is a through line that we can all relate to. Speaking of family, Jeremy, I wanted to ask you, uh, as we got to know Hawkeye more, uh, how do you, why do you feel that he joined Cap's side immediately in this film? He's the one who called. <laughs> I mean, I didn't, I didn't write it. Talk to these guys. They wrote it. No, I, I think private retirement is quite boring. You know, uh, you know, and then you know, go help a friend. And it's not, it's not, the, and the, the moral compass is, is is not far cry from from Cap sort of thinking as well. Anyway, at least that's how I see uh, Hawkeye to be. We're sort he, of principled, and he owes a debt to Scarlet Witch, so um, and her her brother, so. Uh, Yep. You know, when uh, she's under duress, it's a uh, it, it, it's a call to arms for him. Yep. Hello, uh, Jim McCory with GeekDad.com. Uh, kind of an actor question. Actors always fill in the gaps in the backstory in their head of stuff that <clears throat> informs the character that isn't in the script and that we never see. What is all y'all can answer this? 
What is something that you know about your character that we don't know? I think that's like an all never tell kind of moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's on you, man. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel. I don't know. It's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of am on board with you that I think to some degree, I mean, this is almost like the way it is with being an actor in general. Some things, in, in, you know, certain things you want to share and certain things you don't. I think to some degree, it's almost nice having certain parts of the character that are intimate. Um, and ultimately, at the end of the day, these guys do a good job of fleshing out the tones that they want you to see better than we ever could. That's, that's one of the things when I was just doing the interview with you guys, you two and Kevin and the Russos, and they were just talking about how they form these stories and form these arcs. And you really think these things, I'm kind of deviating from the question, but it just feels worthy to bring up because it blew my mind. I've been doing these for a long time now, and we were having an interview, and they were talking about how they were going to a meeting, and sometimes you think with these movies, these giant Marvel movies, any big movie where you think there's a thousand cooks in the kitchen, you assume there's some sort of formula, some algorithm that kicks in, and there's a 30 people in suits being like, this is what it needs to be. But the truth is, it really is Joe and Anthony and Kevin and Nate in a room mapping out stories for so many characters, so many arcs, and they're making them real. They're making them actual fleshed out arcs and conflicts that are worthy of a film. It's, all the explosions in the world aren't gonna make you care. And, and it's, it's nuts to think that it really comes from a few people's brains. And uh, again, this, this is not exactly the answer to the question, but I think it was worth bringing up because it blew my mind because I've been doing this for a while and it was nuts to kind of realize it really does start from just a few people. What was what was your process like in this film as opposed to Winter Soldier when he's not himself, he's not who Captain? Well, just to piggyback on what Chris said, you know, I think I'm always fascinated about the same thing. It's just, you know, for example, our writers, Christopher and Steven, I mean, it's just phenomenal to me the way that they were able to write a script that gave every character a moment, an arch, uh, you know, an arc. And, and particularly, I think they were the ones that kind of figured t the temperature of, of Bucky Barnes, you know, how much of the guy is, is back from the first movie, how much of the Winter Soldier's there. And, and for me, it was just sort of taking it off the page and, and following them, you know. Uh, but a lot of that, I think, is determined in the, in the writing and then also in the decisions that these guys make, you know. And the fun part for me is I never know, you know, uh, where they're going to take it. So. I have a question for Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. um, so in Age of Ultron, you were all, like, scared of your powers. And then in Civil War, you started to gain some confidence, but you still could not really control and you're still terrified of your powers. Do you think... Scarlet Witch will ever be able to have any confidence with her, like real confidence with her powers, or do you think this is the peak of her confidence level? I mean, I, I think what ended up happening was that she was starting to feel confident, but it was more, it wasn't about her powers, it was more about um, the, the conflict she had with making a big mistake. Um, but I think what's interesting is every superhero has a weakness, and I've always thought of hers as um, she's the person who gets in her way, um, that she's kind of limit, limitless. Um, and so that's, to me, an interesting character trait. I don't know what we're going to do next, but um, I'm, I think of her as being like an incredibly strong, powerful person. And, I, and it's also fun because I feel like she, she could flip either way because of her, um, her mind. I think she... I think there are a lot of things that could possibly be played with, but I'm not in control of that. Um, but I think this film was a lot about just conflict in general, um, of what's right, um, how to use your abilities, or whether you should or not. I think that's, that was a consistent theme throughout the whole film. So I think it was just consistent with that, as opposed to her being not confident. <clears throat> she is on a growth arc, yeah. uh, and it is... Uh... It is part of her development. It's very tricky with very powerful characters mm -hmm. because unless they have an internal struggle or a flaw that limits them, then they do become limitless and then the storytelling becomes um, muddled and, and, and not very interesting. Yeah. Uh, you know, if she could have stopped that fight at the airport in, in, in five seconds if she were at the peak of her powers. So uh, it really, you know, it really has to do with, um, um, you know, her character specifically going on a journey to understand uh, uh, what the limits of her, power are, her powers are. She makes a mistake very early in the movie that sets her back. And, uh, and you know, we'll, we'll get to see where she goes in Infinity War. 
seems like you have a pleasant problem. <laughs> it's like, I think after this film, everybody had such a high point. Um, everybody can carry their own solo film. People are going to be clamoring for Captain America 4 and maybe a War Machine movie, and that would be a good idea. And how do you um, deal with that pleasant problem? <clears throat> Great. Hey, listen. That that's that's. Uh, listen, Marvels, and I'm I'm. You know, I've been really talking a lot about this in press, but it really is over the course of the. You know, I've been doing this for a while now, and it really is nice to kind of step back. In the first couple of years of your involvement of the franchise, you're very internal. You're scared about being the thing that's going to cause it. You're going to be awful, and you're very terrified in a very egoic manner. But as you kind of continue on the journey, you kind of realize how amazing it is what they're doing and what they're accomplishing and how fortunate you are to be a part of it, this unbelievable interwebbing of, of stories. And you kind of are just so uh, fortunate to be a part of it. And I say, keep going. Let's keep going. Let's let the wave get bigger and bigger, because it's not stopping. It's not like they're making bad movies. They're making great movies. And you wanna, if you want to keep putting in this Superhero box, you can, but the fact is, it's still good movies. It's good movies that, that they, especially the Russos, they ground them in such an authentic way. It's real humans, real struggles, real conflict, good cinematic storytelling with like a streak of superhero flavor in it. So I say, keep it going. Like, if you can keep doing it, keep doing it.